Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me today. So today I'm going to show you how we build that scale with H100, and I'm going to use EOS as an example. EOS is a DGX superpod, which is a reference model for large data center build. So first, let's start with a little bit of history. I'm lucky enough to join NVIDIA 10 years ago, which was at the infancy of this work. And the timeline here started in 2016, where we shipped and we launched the first DGX one. So the first DGX one was the first server that NVIDIA had with eight GPUs for deep learning training and deep learning in general. And that's also the time at which we created the first supercomputer to start looking at efficiency and performance of deep learning at scale. So here, as I go through the timeline, you're going to see a certain set of very important milestones. The first one is in 2018, where we did the first MLPerf benchmark for a large set of AI important workload at scale. And then it goes on, and you can see that two years later, we end up keep on building those platforms for everybody to use. And we have the first top five supercomputer that runs, and top five is an HPC kind of benchmark, but this supercomputer runs an AI stack. So the supercomputer was called Celine. And not only it would be top five in a supercomputer, but a version of it can be used to be, to be the first one at the green 500 benchmark. So we started looking at scale and efficiency. And the year after, we looked at very large language models. And we could use the same platform with the same design procedure to run very large language model. And today, those are you know, ubiquitous. And everybody needs a very large platform to train those. And we now had the point where we're on the extreme right here of the slides, where we have very large liquid cool systems in production. And today I'm going to guide you through how we use EOS and how we build such a system and what's the reference design and how we do the end-to-end -end architecting behind it. So first, let's look a little bit at numbers. So those are top supercomputers. So the numbers are always something we look at that are very impressive. So at the time of deployment, EOS was the first MLPerf benchmark supercomputer commercially available on-prem system. It was the fastest industrial system in the U.S., ranking number nine on the top 500 uh, system. And it's built with NVIDIA DGX servers. We're going to see how EOS is a superpod. And the configuration is just 4,000 GPU, a little bit more than 4,000 GPU, put together as a superpod, and we're going to get through that. So to get through how we get to perfect scale, we're going to focus first through the physical design and architecture of SuperPod. Then how do we get to perf and what are the speeds and feeds we need to go to get to perf at scale and what the production and software look like on a daily basis. Let's go first to the physical design and architecture of SuperPod. So the end-to-end -end design is the main idea of those systems. The idea was to create a turnkey system, a supercomputer that everybody can buy to run their AI workload. So EOS is a supercomputer, but it's also, and more importantly, the first instance of a reference design that anybody can have. It's a reference architecture for anybody having a DGX H100 server that we sell and support. So you can buy an EOS from NVIDIA, but it's also a reference architecture for hyperscale design. So for people having very large set of GPUs, it's a way to make sure that it's going to work if it's designed the same way. And the real focus is providing the bits for performance for DL at scale so that as soon as it's deployed, it's first fast and incremental to deploy. So you can use a part of it while you keep on building it, right? It's available to our customers day one. So at the bottom right here on this slide, I have an example of one customer super pod which is, it looks very much like EOS, except it's not at NVIDIA, and, and it, it was done almost at the same time. And the idea also, it's, a, it's an expandable design. That means we can start, expand, and keep on expanding while we're in production. So we don't have to wait for the whole system to be up. We can buy the system, deploy the systems, and incrementally add to it so that we can start working on it. So... At the base of every supercomputer, and those in particular, there is a server. Here at the co core of the superpod design, there is the DGX server. So here I have an example of the DGX H100. And that's a very complex slide with a lot of tech spec and so on. The important part here is everything in the server is designed for the best deep learning performance. From the CPU performance, feeding the GPUs from the GPUs communicating together via NVLink, but also externally via InfiniBet, 
but from the storage system being available through no SaaS using Affiniband, but also having that topology working together even with an NVMe cache, right? So we have this very good server for deep learning on its own, but that's also the same building block we use to scale up. So how do we scale the system? We take four of those servers and we put them, we put four of each in a rack using three PDUs. And then we keep on duplicating. So from the server, usually as we design, we move to the rack map. Here's the very engineering rack map. And what happens is we have eight racks of four DGX each in a row, in a small row. And then we put another of 12 total, right? With the management and the storage. And we have another row like that. And we put two rows of the same kind in a cold L containment system that we close. That allows us to control the thermal of the CAC unit, as we call it, and make sure that that subset of GPUs is always cool and environmentally in good conditions to reach performance. Then we then took up those CACs and we call that a pod. And the pod is the best unit of the super pod where it can run on its own, right? It's self-sustainable, but also you can take a lot of pods and combine them together. Right, and so that's where it's important. How do you combine them together? Basically, EOS is the example here. We have five pods that are connected to each other through a split core, right? So for each pod, we have two CACs. The air cooling is partitioned inside the CAC, and we see a row, and at the end of the row, you can see two CDUs there. That's where the liquid cooling distribution underneath the servers goes through. We're gonna discuss that later. But basically, we have the CAC providing a thermally stable environment for those GPUs. Then we have the pod, and then we multiply the pod. Connecting all the pods together, you have the little blue area here and the little orange areas, which are what we're going to describe later. And basically, the blue is the InfiniBand fabric, the compute fabric, where all the GPUs are put together to communicate through that fabric. And it's a split core so that we deploy, we add another one, we connect it to it, we add another one, we connect it to it, and so on and so forth. And orange is the same thing, except it's for the storage. We have to feed those GPUs so they communicate through the blue compute infinite network, and then they get fed through a large storage system that is parallelized and common to all GPUs that is here in orange. So let's go and deep dive a little bit into that. And basically it goes to how do we get to perf and how do we manage to get speed and how we get the speeds and feeds to feed those GPUs. First, it goes through the compute infinite fabric. So it's a pretty complex architecture, but basically it's a factory for performance. And it's a factory that has the split core, which is so the layout. And that factory is made of lean spine group. So it's well optimized. What is very interesting here, you see at the bottom, the green boxes, each corresponds to a server. Each server has a GPU. So but basically GPU one is connected from machine one, is connecting to leap switch one, and GPU one from machine two is also connected to leaf switch one, et cetera, et cetera. And basically what happens is all the GPU ones talk to each other through the same switch and you have that leaf spine block there. It's designed like that to allow for the best performance of the collectives of AI system. A lot of it is all reduced where basically it's actually from a performance standpoint, better to run like that. And so here you can see at the base of the model, right, we have a set of lean spine group. And here the set of lean spine group for that size, it's four by four, right? A group of 32 nodes, each of them are connected to a single switch, right? And rail groups are made of four leaf switches and spine switches. There are eight rails total per pod, one per rail. And here it's a model to go to 4,000 GPUs, but you can actually extend that model by using a biggest pod size at the beginning. And if you use a 32 for 32 leaf spine group size, for example, we can increase all the way to 64,000 GPUs. So in practice, that gets laid out in a data center like that. So the blue fabric here. The design integrate coolings and thermal at the DC level. And we've seen the super pod layout with a split core, right? So each unit is going to be run independently or with the others. But also, it's aligned at the data center with the power distribution. So here I show an example of how the power lines are aligned on the EOS data center. That means not only we can build incrementally, but if we need to run maintenance on the subset of the infrastructure, we can do that, keeping the balancing and running independently different parts of the data center. The same thing happens when we look at liquid cooling. So basically, all the power lines are also aligned to the liquid cooling secondary loops cooling distribution units, the CDUs on the extremity, and the manifolds. 
So that means tomorrow, if I'm in operation and I need to, again, run a maintenance or separate the different piece of the infrastructure, I just need to shut down one pod, but everything aligns so it's easy for me to run maintenance on a subset. So to go back to the floor plan physical layout, you know, we discussed the blue, we discussed the orange, and that's where we have all this. So I talked about the blue, but I haven't talked about the orange yet. And so the orange is basically how we feed the GPU. How we get, so the blue was how the GPU talk to each other. The orange is how do we get the data to the GPUs. And basically, we have a storage architecture, which is made as a memory hierarchy. So I've shown quickly the server, where we know we have memory, and we have very fast speed memory in the server. Then the server has a lot of NVMe local drives that provide another level of storage. And then the orange is all the systems share a network file system. And here we use a very fast parallel file system providing a new order of magnitude of 10 terabytes of data that will also, that can be used directly to feed the data of the GPUs. We can also connect to an object storage to, to add uh, another layer. And I mentioned the GPU talk through the blue fabric. The data comes from the orange fabric, the storage fabric. There are some models where we can merge those together. Here, we decided to separate them to provide maximum performance for compute on the blue fabric because of the RDMA-based traffic, right? While we allow on the orange fabric to prefetch the data for the GPUs, for reads, for example, make sure the data we train on gets very fast to the GPU, but also for writes. Once we've done with a training part, we want to be able to checkpoint, to be able to take it back from that checkpoint or restart from there. And that's why we have a hierarchy with so many layers that allows us to cache at each layer, again, for faster performance. So, okay, so we've seen the layout. We've seen the speeds and feeds and the fabrics. What software do we use to operate that? So in production, because everything is in a data center and we want to make sure we watch everything at the same time and it's end-to-end, -end, we use a lot of telemetry. We want to make sure we can ensure performance by making sure every GPU, for example, is cooled correctly, is having the power it needs, and so on, as we run. Telemetry comes from two different types of sources, the one that we call in-band, right, which comes from the software running in the US. That's basically when you run, right? And then there's the other bands, like on the side, from systems that are around the server or attached to the server but not interfere, interacting with the US, we can pull for example, from the basement, the BMC, or, or any other sources like that, and that does not affect at all the application performance, right? For that, we use a set of tools that are already available in the data center and that widely used already in data center and already for performance application and telemetry. Prometheus, which is an open source database, exporters, Grafana or also Splunk. But basically, we can interact with a set of databases that are collecting events, able to stream data and let us know at every point in time whether our GPU are healthy, whether the environmentals in the data center, the temperature and the liquid cooling temperatures and so on are good. And we can look at this at the same time to help us debug application performance should there be a problem or even interrupt operation should we not be able to maintain performance at the level we need. So. Once we have the telemetry, the GPUs, and so on, we need to make sure that the application today I run on my laptop when I'm you know, prototyping my deep learning training, I can run on a very large set of nodes. And the challenge with a deep learning model is we need a lot of induration, we need able to tune at scale and so on. And for that, I need to make sure the performance is the same everywhere in a very consistent manner. I don't want to have the stack on my laptop to behave differently on the cluster. And so for that, we use at NVIDIA a software stack that is very oriented towards container. We're going to deep dive into that a little bit later. But basically, on the cluster, it's transparent to the user what the OS OS is, what the GPU driver is, and what the IB driver and all those difficult systems bits are. Because from a user perspective, the user comes with a container on the container runtime and selects the scale at which they want to run and their hyperparameter and don't have to worry about all this. So how do we make that happen? We make sure that we have a set of tuned container. They rely on the LibNVIDIA container, which is a library that makes it easy to run CUDA applications inside containers. NVIDIA releases on a monthly basis containers for the major framework. For example, I got a couple examples here. 
for example, PyTorch. And every month we make sure that at scale for the, the most ubiquitous models in the money, we know the performance is guaranteed and we can scale to a very large set of GPUs. We use them every day at NVIDIA for every single in our infrastructure, whether it's benchmarking, whether it's deployment, whether it's our application, our research, and so on. And basically, they include a validated set of libraries to make sure everybody gets performance so that, you know, if you're deep learning researchers, you don't have to worry about making sure you make good use of the GPUs. They're very portable. So that means as you go to the cluster, you know that container is already validated for that cluster and you don't have to worry about it not running or having to compile or do anything like that. So to be able to run those containers, it, it's still a very large cluster with a lot of users. And, you know, we use a batch scheduling mechanism where you submit your job and you wait for the resource to be available to launch. So the way it works is we're using a traditional HPC-like model using Slurm as a scheduler resource manager, where basically we queue up jobs, telling them we want to run that on that many nodes with relatively short wall time to make sure we got a lot of turnaround. And we make sure we use Pixis to launch our own container runtime, which is a minimal runtime called Enroot. So all of this is open source software that is available to everybody. And so basically we use that and we launch our containers on the cluster and we can launch that at any scale. And here we benchmark application performance. And for example, for people having H100 at scale from the containers version 23.10, we know we're going to get performance at any scale using this stack. So what's the next step? We got the software stack, we got the machines, we got the large cluster, we can run everything. The next generation products need even more performance. And as we go and we go bigger and bigger, we have to get efficient at this. When we started doing super pods, you know, we never envisioned we would go through 32K or 64K GPU being the default deployment size today. And so basically we need to keep on building. We need to be, keep on building at scale Will's building blocks that are targeted to scale. So here is an insight into the next generation of products. So on the left, I got the enterprise form factor DGX B200 factor, which is the successor of the previous one that I showed you with BH100. So that's the DGX B200 enterprise form factor, same ID that you've seen before in a regular rack. And we can scale the same way using in-place replacement, it's the same model, it's the same ID. You can just change the server of Go if you wish, and you would just get extra performance like that. The other form factor we use, it's an OCP form factor that is liquid cool DGX system. So it's a much denser system, allowing for a lot of efficiency here. And it's running multi-node and building in here, adding another fabric and another high-performance inter-GPU communication layer. And so as we take the systems and we build them to the next level, we can see that the next-gen systems are going to be targeted at scale and at efficiency day one. So the generic design that we've used before for a couple generations that allows unprecedented scales for us will keep on growing, and the system will be used for that too. And so what do we need to do? We need better handling at the data center level of all that scaling, all those components working to, with each other. We know this will push the limits of infrastructure, of power, of pooling, how we can do software, how we can control things, just because of the size, the sheer size of the systems. And for me, that's really the next engineering challenge, how we can get the software better and we can keep the performance at such large scale with so much impact on the environment. So I'm really for looking forward to this. I'm also looking forward at what you guys are going to deploy, what everybody's going to deploy here. And I wanted to thank you for your attention and looking forward to the next challenge.